cat with a target inside. You know, the focus in the eyes, just the look of that cat. She just raises her shoulders up, keeping her head in exactly the same position, but the rest of the body comes up to join it. And then she's ready to go. Where is she? Here she comes. Here she comes, flat out. Straight towards me. Oh, look, go, turning. Turning, flat out, look at this, right past the car. There she goes, there she goes, right behind me, right behind me. She's almost on it, almost on it, got it, she's got it. Okay, she's got a meal, fantastic for the cubs. God, that was unbelievable. I mean, it was like straight down the barrel, ears back, flat out. Wow. Honey, you really are a great hunter. Hey guys, this is Mr. Mahmood and you are watching video number one for the ecology unit. In this video we're going to focus in on food chains and food webs, the differences between them and all of the details within them. This should be all a review for you guys from middle school, but it wouldn't hurt to review it again. So let's get started. Uh, let's start with the video. Why do you think I showed you guys that video to get things started? Or how about think about this way. I could have also showed you this. Right, not the most exciting thing, right? I know the first one probably is a little more appealing to most of you, but the reality is they both represent the exact same thing. They both represent one organism having to feed off another in order to get the food and energy that they need to survive. It's all about energy flow here. So when we talk about food chains and food webs, we're going to discuss the energy flow within them. All right, so if we're discussing energy, we have to first talk about the source of energy. Uh, for most ecosystems on Earth, the ultimate source of energy would be the sun. There are very few exceptions to this rule, uh, maybe certain ecosystems where there is no solar energy, like deep, deep in the oceans. But for the purpose of this unit, we're going to go ahead and assume that all energy originates from the sun. All right, so there are basically two categories of organisms in any given ecosystem. They're the ones that can actually use solar energy directly to make their own food, all independently, take care of themselves, or we have the other category of organisms that cannot make their own food and therefore have to feed off of other things in order to get the energy. We'll talk about both of those here as we go through. You should know if we talk about solar energy being used to make food, we're referring to photosynthesis. We're going to talk about photosynthesis many times throughout the year, so hopefully you already have a good understanding of it. Basically, it's the idea of organisms taking solar energy, carbon dioxide, and water, and being able to produce sugar from that. Sugar is going to be that chemical energy source that's eventually going to pass its way through the entire ecosystem. In the process of producing sugar, they release oxygen gas, which also typically helps most organisms. Uh, in the same ecosystem. All right, so the ultimate source of energy is the sun. When we talk about organisms that can feed off of that, that's one category. Organisms that cannot make up a second category where they have to get their food from somewhere else. So before we get into the details of what those organisms are called, we first need to get the basics of a food chain. Now, a food chain is uh, a representation of just one organism at each trophic level within an ecosystem. When I talk about some of those terms, we have to be specific. First off, the term organism. An organism means a living thing. So if we're talking about only discussing organisms in a food chain, then there's a reason that you only see two arrows here instead of three. There are four pictures here, but only three of them are considered organisms. And you, you can tell the sunlight is not considered an organism. Another word for um, an organism or a living thing, if something is living, another term is biotic, B-I-O-T-I-C. If something is biotic, that means it's living. So of the four diagrams here, only three of the four are considered biotic. Solar energy or sunlight is an abiotic factor. Abiotic is the opposite, non-living. So typically in an ecosystem, abiotic factors would include things like the sun, uh, any reference to water, any discussion of the atmospheric air, uh, the geology or the actual earth and the rock itself, all of those things are considered non-living parts of an ecosystem. So when we talk about a food chain, we're only focused on what's living, the living component. So looking at this food chain here, again, you're representing just one organism at each trophic level. So we're assuming that within this ecosystem, there is only a single organism 
at this first level, a single organism at the second, and a single organism at the third. You hear me referencing trophic levels, T-R-O-P-H-I-C. A trophic level is also known as a feeding level. The, uh, the word troph just means feeding. We'll use that, that suffix again uh, in the same discussion. So trophic levels refer to different feeding levels. The first trophic level, as you see here, is represented by a producer. The second trophic level is represented by consumer number one. And the third trophic level is represented by consumer number two. So we're going to get into more details on what those mean here in a minute. The last thing I want to go into before we move on is these arrows. If you guys look at these arrows, Notice how the arrows are always pointing in a specific direction. Now, it doesn't mean they always point right or they always point left. The arrows represent the flow of energy. A lot of people make a mistake here and say, okay, I know that the mouse is capable of eating the grass. So I'm going to draw an arrow from the mouse to the grass because that's the direction that the mouse is taking to get its food. That's not what we're representing here. Remember, we're representing the flow of energy. So the flow of energy is going from the grass to the mouse whenever the mouse eats it. Just like, say you had a bowl of cereal for breakfast, the, all the carbohydrates and the sugars that are in that cereal are coming to you. you. They're entering your body as you eat it, and now you have the ability of using those sugars as your own energy source. So the arrow always represents the flow of energy. Please don't forget that. All right, now we can start talking about the specifics within a food chain. The first trophic level, remember the feeding levels, trophic level number one, is always going to be taken up by a producer. A producer is an organism that's capable of making its own food. Another word for that is what we call an autotroph. So let's break some of these words down. The prefix auto means self. If uh, you have like an automatic transmission, it's self-controlling, right? Uh, auto means self. Trophic, like we said before, or troph means feeding. So autotroph literally means self-feeding. So an autotroph is an organism that can self-feed, make its own food, typically through photosynthesis. So in this case, because we're using the sunlight as the ultimate source of energy as the example, a producer is an autotroph that is capable of going through photosynthesis in order to make its own energy. Right? So photosynthesis, again, is the process of using solar energy to make sugar. In the, in the process, they use up carbon dioxide and water and release oxygen as a waste product. All right, so all producers are organisms that can make their own energy or autotrophs, and they're always going to be represented at the beginning of any food chain because they're the ones that are essential for turning the solar energy into chemical energy, into sugar. Without that transition, none of the other organisms can survive because they can't do what producers can do. So it's very important that we have producers at the first trophic level in order to get that solar energy converted into a source of energy or sugar that all other organisms can use. All right, so I'll give you some examples here. Typically, when we talk about producers, we're referring to organisms in the kingdom plantae or plants, but there are other examples of organisms that can be uh, photosynthetic and make their own energy. So don't always assume plants, but they do typically represent plants in the first trophic level. All right, so trophic level number one is always represented by a producer. Okay. Consumers represent every other trophic level in the ecosystem. Now, there are multiple variations of that in, the, in, in our discussion here. So starting here, notice how of the three organisms in this food chain, we already have the producer in trophic level one, and we actually have two different consumers, sorry about the line, two different consumers here representing trophic levels two and three. So depending on where you are in an ecosystem you might be a different kind of consumer but the general definition of a consumer is anything that basically cannot be a producer if they're not capable of making their own food that means they have to get their food from somewhere else they're considered a consumer another name for that is a heterotroph remember we said before an autotroph is self-feeding the prefix hetero means different and we said again trough means feeding so heterotrophs are literally different feeders they have to get their food from a different source they can't make it themselves so both of the videos that you guys saw at the beginning the cheetah and the cow are both examples of consumers because they have to get their energy from somewhere else they can't just stand out on the field and expect to get their sugar so an organism that cannot make their own food has to gain their energy from somewhere else is what we consider a consumer, also known as a heterotroph. Right? And it gives multiple examples of that. All of the kingdom animalia are heterotrophs, but there are also uh, organisms in multiple kingdoms that represent the same thing. So we're not just talking about animals here, uh, but animals do fall into the category of consumers. So now let's get into the different types of consumers. Let's say that you're a consumer that only ate plants only ate the primary consumer or sorry only ate the producer that would make you an herbivore so in this example our mouse 
because of its position in the food chain, is considered an organism that only eats what arrows are pointed to it. In this case, it's only eating the trophic level before it. So since the trophic level before it, trophic level 1 is the producer, this mouse is in trophic level 2. Because it's in trophic level 2, it only feeds off of trophic level 1. So that means by definition, it only eats producers. That is the definition of an herbivore. So an herbivore is an organism that only eats producers. Plants kind of follows the general example, but remember you can have just about any type of producer. So an organism that only eats producers is called an herbivore. And some other important things when you're looking at a food chain, an herbivore is always what we consider the primary consumer. I say primary like first. The first consumer in a given food chain is always going to be the herbivore. Just like you see in this food chain here, because it only, it only eats what's before it, in this case the mouse only eats the, the plant and therefore is considered an herbivore. You're not going to see an herbivore in any higher trophic levels because they eat what's before it. So by definition, if you have a consumer, and then a second consumer after it, the second consumer eats the first and is no longer an herbivore because it's not just eating plants. So only if you see the consumer in the second trophic level can you call that consumer an herbivore because it's eating what's before it. So herbivores are also known as primary consumers, or the first consumers, and they're always in the second trophic level. This is going to mess you up, uh, a lot of people up, because they confuse the idea of primary with first trophic level. Remember, the first trophic level is always a producer. So that means the second trophic level is where you're actually going to introduce the first consumer. So the second trophic level will have the primary consumer, the third trophic level will have the secondary consumer, and so on. So in this example, the third trophic level is our snake. So the snake is what we consider the secondary consumer in this food chain even though it's in the third trophic level. So it's always going to be off by one because the first trophic level is always taken up by a producer. First consumer comes in trophic level two and so on. So if we're talking about trophic level two, it's only eating what's before it in terms of the plant. That's why we consider it an herbivore. All right, gives you multiple examples of herbivores. The key thing here is don't bring in any outside knowledge. Even if you think, all right, you've seen a mouse eat other things besides plants and so it's not an herbivore, that's going against what we'd be expecting you to learn. If I show you a food chain, you have to assume that that's all the information you're given, and given that information, you can describe the ecosystem. So in this case, that mouse only eats grass. Okay. So make sure you don't, don't bring in too much outside knowledge. Focus in on the information given to you to be able to answer questions. So the herbivore is a primary consumer, only eats plants. A carnivore, then, in contrast, is an organism that only eats consumers, or only eats other heterotrophs. So in this example, our snake is going to be our carnivore because it's in a position where it's eating what's before it. The arrow is coming from the mouse to the snake. That means the only thing in this diet for the purpose of this discussion uh, for the snake is the mouse. So because it only eats mice, it only eats other consumers, we'd call it a carnivore. So that means a carnivore will never actually be put in the, into uh, the second trophic level or will never be considered the primary consumer because it has to have a consumer before it if it's considered a carnivore, because that means it can only eat what's before it and therefore only eats other consumers. So a carnivore isn't actually going to be introduced until trophic level number three or higher, right? And then that means we wouldn't consider it uh, anything lower than a secondary consumer. So secondary consumers on are where you might introduce and see other carnivores. So carnivores represent organisms that only eat other consumers gives you a few examples of those there. Now we continue on to the food chains. If we see higher level carnivores, maybe ones that uh, are truly don't have any natural predators, we consider those not only just carnivores, but carnivores that are at the top of the food chain. Therefore, we call them top carnivores. So if the organism only eats other consumers, so you see there's an arrow here, this hawk is in trophic level four. We call it the tertiary consumer. Three, by the way, is tertiary, T-E-R-T-I-A-R-Y. The tertiary consumer is what we see here as the hawk. So uh, higher level carnivores, the top of them with no natural predators, we would consider a top carnivore. All right. So we have herbivores that are in the second trophic level, and then carnivores introduce everything on in a typical food chain. All right. Now, if we do get away from the idea of one organism only eating what's before it, now we can introduce the idea of an omnivore. Omnivore, omni means all, or like general, so an omnivore is an organism that can actually eat both plants and animals, or both producers and consumers. So in this food chain, there are no omnivores. 
based on what you see here, there is not an organism that seems to be able to feed off of both organisms, both categories. The only way that I could represent an omnivore here, let's say I were to draw an arrow from the producer all the way to the snake, skipping the mouse. So that means that now not only does the mouse eat the, that producer, the snake eats the producer too. So this snake has an arrow coming to it from a producer and from a consumer, and therefore it's capable of eating both. So only if you see something like this would you introduce an organism as a possible omnivore. And I should also reference, we as a human species are omnivores. I know there are uh, groups of us that may be vegetarian or only eat meat or things like that, but we have to think about what the species is genetically capable of digesting. So we as a human species are capable of digesting both producers and consumers, so we're considered omnivores. All right, so gives you some examples of those. And again, when we talk about omnivores, depending on how you follow the food chain, uh, you're not going to see it at the first trophic level. You have to have the omnivore fairly high up so that it has both producers and other consumers below it so that they can feed off of, uh, off of those things and call themselves omnivores. Omnivores usually have more variety. Because they have more variety in their diet, usually have a better chance of survival. If there was some sort of a drastic change in the ecosystem, uh, they could adapt typically a little better. All right. I'll give you some examples of them here. All right, uh, the last definition of categories within a typical ecosystem beyond the producers and the consumers are what we call decomposers. A decomposer is an organism that's capable of actually breaking down dead or decaying organic matter. They're very important in cycling nutrients within an ecosystem. We're going to talk about cycles in the next few videos. Decomposers play a very important role in that. So when something dies, their energy may not be able to be used anymore, but the nutrients like carbon, nitrogen, and things like that can definitely be pulled away and redistributed within the ecosystem. So it happens in multiple ways. We'll get into that a little bit more in the next few videos. But a decomposer is an organism that actually takes nutrients away from dead and decaying matter. So if you were to represent that in a food chain, you would actually draw an arrow to the decomposer from every trophic level. Because as long as the decomposer is close, it can take the nutrients away from that organism. And decomposers usually are what cause all that decay and the nasty smell and things like that when, when something's dead for a long period of time because they're taking all those nutrients away and in the process they, they leave behind certain things that cause smells and odors and colors and all the different things you see from that. So a decomposer is very important for all ecosystems because they're responsible for recycling nutrients from dead or decaying organisms. All right. Um, last thing to understand the basic uh, definition here, the idea is a 10% rule. A 10% rule just represents that not all of the energy actually makes it from one trophic level to the next. Here's what I mean by that. A producer, this plant for example, can make its own food. So throughout its entire lifetime, it's made 100% of its own energy and therefore has 100% of its own energy available to it. Now when the mouse, the primary consumer, or the herbivore, right, when the mouse eats that producer, it's not going to get 100% of the energy that that plant's ever made because that plant's used most of its energy throughout its own lifetime. So that means you're pretty much just left with whatever energy is within that organism at the exact time that the mouse was eating it. So even though it's not always an exact science, we typically round it out to about 10% of energy making it from one level to the next. So let's say the producer started out with 1,000 calories of energy. Okay, the mouse, by the 10% rule, is only going to get 10% of that thousand. If you ever need to do some quick math to get 10% of something, just take out a zero, move the decimal place, sorry, the decimal one place to the left. So, uh, if you have a thousand calories, the mouse would, by definition, only get a hundred of those calories, right? A uh, hundred calories probably isn't enough for that mouse to survive its entire lifetime. But the reality is, the mouse is eating multiple blades of grass throughout its own life, so it's gaining all the calories it needs. It's just not getting them all from that one piece of grass. right? So okay, we went from 1,000 now to 100 in the mouse. Now follow the same 10% rule when the snake eats the mouse. It's only getting 10% of that 100 calories, or technically 10 calories. Again, that's a very small amount of energy, but because the mouse ate multiple blades of grass, it's not only just gaining 10 calories, it's gaining the 10 calories from each blade of grass that that mouse ever ate. So for following energy through from the producer, we're only thinking about the energy that was in that one blade of grass. 
at the beginning of the food chain. So the 1,000 calories of energy only converted to about 100 in the mouse, only to about 10 in the snake, and that means only to about one calorie in that hawk. Very small amount of energy, but we're only talking about the energy that was in that single blade of grass at the beginning of the food chain. So again, because each level eats multiple of what's before it, it gains all the energy it needs, and then when an organism feeds off of it, it gets significantly more energy than what we see in this one single food chain. So just make sure you understand the 10% rule, only about 10% of energy passes from one level to the next. And again, just a review of trophic levels here. The producers are considered trophic level one. Our primary consumer, or herbivore, falls in trophic level two. The introduction of a carnivore can't happen until trophic level three, because now we have a consumer before it that can feed off of it. So this is our first carnivore. And then trophic level four represents our second carnivore, or our tertiary, or third consumer, that we would now call a top carnivore because of its position in the food chain. And again, decomposers, if they were represented in this food chain, would be taking nutrients away from all of the trophic levels. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, I, I brushed by it, but decomposers typically fall into two kingdoms and categories. We talk about bacteria and fungi as the typical types of decomposers. And again, we'll get into more detail on that later. All right, so make sure you understand how trophic levels work, make sure you understand the 10% rule. Now the last thing we're going to talk about today is a food web. A food web is actually a better representation, uh, a more realistic representation of an ecosystem because in reality organisms that need to gain energy from somewhere else, our consumers, usually find more than one source of food. And this food web would actually represent that. So uh, anywhere you see an arrow going from one organism to the next, that suggests that the energy is moving from one organism to the next. So if I'm an organism that has three arrows coming to me, that means I have three different things that I can feed off of and three different things that are part of my diet. So let's do some basic practice here. Uh, looking at these, let's start by finding our producers. So take a minute and see if you can find the producers in this food web. Good. It's not always left to right, right? In this case, it's kind of a bottom to top representation. But there are actually three examples. Sorry, let me see if I can draw this a little better. Three examples of producers in this ecosystem. Not the best, I know. But the three examples are what you see there. The berries and the flowers, the grasses and the seeds. I can call them producers because they don't actually have any arrows pointing to them which means they can make their own energy. They use solar energy, the sun, to make the sugar. So uh, here are our three producers. Now, these are what we consider organisms that would be at the first trophic level if I were to make a separate food chain from them. Looking on, let's see if we can find our primary consumers, or our herbivores. Organisms that only eat plants. Be careful here. We're looking for herbivores. Let's see what you get. All right, I'm going to start on the left. The deer here would be considered an herbivore or a primary consumer because the only arrow coming to it is this one right here from berries and flowers. It has a single arrow pointing to it, which means it's only feeding off of berries and flowers. It's an herbivore. Another example, it doesn't label this as a butterfly. It labeled all the other organisms, but this butterfly here would be considered a primary consumer or an herbivore. It actually has two sources of producers in its diet. It can eat berries and flowers or grasses. Again, based on this diagram. Don't bring any outside knowledge in. Just follow what's here. Uh, another example of an herbivore would be this marmot. If you look, the marmot has one source of energy in its diet. That source of energy would be grasses. So again, it's only eating producers. It's what we consider a primary consumer or an herbivore. All right, now let's see, oh, I'm sorry, uh, there's one more, the chipmunk, it's up there, it's kind of sneaky, you have to be very careful, make sure you're catching them all. A chipmunk here is also considered a primary consumer, because the only arrow pointing to it is coming from seeds. You notice that there are multiple arrows maybe pointing away, but there's only one arrow pointing to it. So the chipmunk is what we consider another herbivore. All right, let's see if we can talk about carnivores. Find me an organism that is purely a carnivore. There's only one, if you look. It's the red-tailed hawk up here at the top. This red-tailed hawk is a pure carnivore. It has multiple resources. It doesn't just eat one species. But the things that it does eat would be a grouse, which is a consumer, a chipmunk, and the marmot. All three of those are consumers. It doesn't have any ability of feeding off of plants or producers based on this web, and therefore it's our only carnivore in this diagram. Now, why wouldn't I call the... Grizzly bear, a carnivore. What would you call it? 
hopefully, you're able to see this arrow right here. This arrow is very important. Coming from the berries and the flowers, you notice how there's an arrow pointing all the way up to our grizzly bear. That arrow means that the grizzly bear is capable of feeding off of producers. Now you should also have quickly been able to see the arrow coming from the deer, coming from the marmot, and coming from the chipmunk, all of which are consumers. So that means not only can a grizzly bear eat other consumers, but it is also capable of feeding off of producers. What would that make it? An omnivore, exactly. So our omnivore is the grizzly bear. Uh, we're skipping two things here. There's actually one more omnivore in this diagram. We've probably, process of elimination here, been able to recognize that the grouse technically is considered an omnivore here. Why? Okay, hopefully you're able to see, looking at the grouse, there are three things that it's capable of eating, three arrows coming. One from the berry, one from the butterfly, and then the one from the seeds. So the berries and the seeds would make it a, an herbivore if that was all that it was capable of eating, but because it's also able to eat a butterfly, it's considered a, a, an omnivore. It can eat both consumers and producers. And you'll notice down here we have our decomposers. Uh, the term detritivore just means like a scavenger. Typically they only eat things, uh, the flesh of things after they die. So like um, sharks, uh, vultures, things like that would be considered detritivores. Don't worry too much about that. But decomposers are the ones we focus in on, the ones that typically absorb nutrients away from dead and decaying matter so that those nutrients can be recycled back in the ecosystem. And it only shows a few arrows being pointed to those, uh, but technically you can draw an arrow from every single organism over to that decomposer. All right, so hopefully you have a good understanding of the difference between a food chain and a food web. A food web is a much more realistic representation of them. And uh, within a food chain and web, you know the difference between the types of uh, carnivore, uh, herbivore, omnivores, types of consumers, as well as the role of producers within that ecosystem. All right, guys, thanks for watching the video, and I'll see you next time.